then I would directly invite our next speaker, uh, Konstantin Schauerbecker, Dr. Konstantin Schauerbecker. This, the stage is yours. Uh, the po this is your pointer. Missed the presentation. So? I think it should load. The team behind will load the presentation and then you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Konstantin Schauwecker from Narian, and I have the pleasure today to talk to you about stereo vision. So first of all, though, I want to say a few words about Narian, um, who we are, what we do. Um, Narian was founded back in 2015, right here in Stuttgart, where we are still located. And basically, basically what we do is, um, we make, we make um, high-speed FPGA-based stereovision cameras. And um, yes, this is, this is our, our key technology, on which we've been, fo been focusing ever since. And we supplied our cameras um, all over the globe uh, to, to um, numerous prestigious customers. And um, as of this year, we are now a member of the TKH Vision family. So um, this time you can actually find us at the uh, TKH Vision booth in Hall 10. So first, uh, just as a recap, um, um, a recap of how Stereo Vision uh, works. Um, Stereo Vision is a, a passive sensing technology. So in essence, this means we don't have to emit light for performing our measurements. Uh, we can just use the ambient light that's uh, there on the scene anyway. Um, basically, uh, it's mimicking how we, we humans are able to perceive depth. So we are taking uh, two images from different viewing positions, and we can infer the depth information just by, by correlating, uh, correlating these two images and finding uh, corresponding points. Uh, that means that actually all of the intelligence um, is in the image processing. And if you want to do this well, um, you need to throw a lot of computing hardware at it. At it. And um, this is the key challenge here, the, um, the high processing demands that uh, stereo, uh, stereo vision implies. Um, so how, how does it compare to um, the more conventional active 3D sensors, such as uh, time of light or structured light cameras? Um, yes, as I said, the key difference is that, well, we, we are passive, we don't have to emit light. And that has some key advantages. So I think uh, for us, number one advantage is that uh, you can take a stereo camera outdoors into the bright daylight, and it will work just as well as indoors, because we don't have a, don't have a contrast problem. Um, we don't have to... We don't have to um, we don't need a projector that can be overcast by the, uh, the sunlight. Uh, in the same sense, um, we're not really limited in range as uh, to how, how far we can sense, or we can do long-range sensing with a stereo camera. You just need the right camera setup. Um, we can have multiple sensors with overlapping field of view, and we also can do a color perception with a stereo camera. But there's one major um, downside to stereo vision, and that is that uh, we, need, we need visible texture information. So, so uh, a textural surface, like a blank white wall, uh, cannot be measured because there will, will not be any um, visual information there um, that we could sense. Um, to overcome this problem, uh, what can be done is, is a, a hybrid approach where we have an uh, active pattern projection together with a stereo camera. So um, there's an example scene here, which is actually very challenging for a stereo camera because there's, there's uh, no textures in the background. The foreground objects have very little texture to them. So this makes um, sensing particularly difficult. Um, and if we look at the depth map that we get from he here at the bottom, so the, the purple colors means, uh, means a closer depth to the camera, we can see that we have quite some large gaps in the measurements. And we can now, uh, even, even in such a, a difficult scene, we can get uh, near-perfect measurements if we have a texture projector. So we have here on the top right corner, we have uh, the scene, what it looks like with a projected uh, texture on it. And uh, then we get this very dense death map that we have at the bottom. But now with 
now with this um, this so-called so-called active zero vision approach, there's one uh, downside again, and that is that uh, well now we can't do any color perception anymore because well we have this pattern that's gonna interfere with with our sensing, and so this was. This was um, our motivation for the design of our latest um, stereo camera that we have been um, releasing here at the Vision Show um, this week, um, which is here our new Ruby 3D depth camera. And now Ruby, Ruby integrates um, several things into one camera. Um, we have two monochrome sensors, so these are the auto ones, which we use for um, stereo, stereo vision depth perception. Then we have a, a random dot laser projector um, in the middle, uh, plus a third color sensor uh, that is used for the color sensing, um, all integrated into one single camera unit. Uh, the way that this camera works is um, the, the uh, random dot laser projector is, uh, uses infrared light that is visible to the monochrome camera, as cameras that we use for depth sensing, but it is not visible um, to the color cameras. So we can do, we can do color sensing here um, without, um, without getting artifacts uh, or, or altered measurements uh, from, the, from the pattern projector. The pattern projector itself um, assists depth sensing for, for indoor and close, close to mid-range applications. Um, but for um, outdoor, ap outdoor applications, when there's um, l larger me measurement distances uh, or, or brighter ambient light, um, we can still do entirely passive 3D sensing uh, without the without the the projector. And um, and yes, and because we have a, a split between these monochrome and and color sensors, uh, or we have, because we have the separate color sensor for the for the sensor, we can use these uh, superior monochrome sensors for stereo vision, because um, which is very beneficial because we don't have any um, color matrix in front of the sensor that that introduces artifacts or re reduces the light sensitivity. Now. If we look at some um, example pictures that um, we recorded um, with with our new Ruby camera, um, there's this this one here is an example for a challenging indoor um, recording. So we have this pallet here that's been loaded with bags, and actually the entire pallet is is all foil wrapped, which makes this a difficult surface to measure. There's also not too much texture um, there to be seen, but still we get this um, very dense depth map that we can see on the right where we can even make out uh, the boundaries between the individual bags, um, as well as, as we even see, uh, see in the, this completely blank uh, white background, uh, we still get uh, pretty good dense measurements. Um, if we take the camera um, outdoors, um, uh, this is the promise that, that we get there. So here, here definitely is just as good or even, even better than for the indoor case. So we get a very dense measurement here. Even though this was recorded at a bright uh, day where the uh, projected pattern was not visible, but we have a lot of texture here in the image. So there's actually we don't need a pattern projector here if we have enough texture here, uh, texture that is uh, that can be seen. And in our experience, is um, as soon as you as, as soon as you step out outdoors into, um, away from a clean indoor environment, suddenly you have texture information everywhere, and um, then uh, you don't need any active projection anyway. Um, then there's one more thing that our Ruby camera does, which is um, it aligns the color image to the depth, depth measurements. So in fact, in fact um, the, there, is, there is physically a small parallax between the color, color sensor and the monochrome sensor. But because we have the uh, 3D measurements, we know where everything is, is located in space. We can do this um, alignment, and suddenly we have for Every single pixel, we get exact color information and depth information. So um, we can actually generate uh, a colored 3D point cloud in real time uh, from the measurements. And by the way, this is something that you can see um, today at the demo at our booth, uh, where we showcase um, a real time live um, a color 3D point cloud uh, display. Um, some other specs about the camera. So um, what what performance can we achieve? Um, we, have, uh, we can achieve image resolutions of up to 1.5 megapixels with the cameras. We can achieve up to 60 uh, frames per second. 
though not not at the not at the full resolution, but um, but you have a choice there between whether whether you want to prioritize image resolution or prioritize frame rate. In general, um, in general, but our constant is that we can achieve um, 24 million 3D points per second, and uh, it's up to you to, to divide to, to divide that up uh, between uh, frame rate and resolution. Um, also, the camera integrates a built-in inertial measurement unit, which um, I find um, is a very important feature for uh, for all mobile robotics applications. And despite of all these all these uh, features that we integrated, it's um, it's the most most uh, affordable camera yet uh, that we have brought out uh, on the market. So it's, in my opinion, a very very um, um, cost-effective uh, sensing solution. Um, a brief look at what's what's inside the camera. Um, yes, the, the 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 key here is um, the FPGA that we have uh, built in. So we we have a powerful FPGA inside that camera, and on this we run all all the image processing with our, our with our proprietary um, Stereovision pipeline. And this means that this means. Because we do, we're doing all of the processing inside the camera, um, that no computations have to be done on the host PC, other than other than the application-specific um, um, application that the customer wants to run. So it's um, all of the all of the uh, pro uh, computing resources of your PC. Uh, they are there for your application. You don't have to do any any uh, 3D image processing, uh, low-level 3D image processing yourself. Um, then also because of the FPGA, we can achieve a very low latency for the measurements. Um, then uh, the device also has a low power consumption of just nine, nine watts, which allows this uh, to be easily integrated onto um, mobile battery-powered uh, systems. And it comes in this uh, very uh, small, uh, small and compact form factor. On the software side, uh, we can program Ruby uh, with all of the uh, software frameworks and libraries that uh, our, uh, that we support with our other cameras. This means that we have an open source Python and uh, C++ API. Uh, we support the, the uh, popular open source um, uh, frameworks like ROS, uh, but also OpenCV and the Open3D library. But we also support all of the well-known machine vision um, software suits like Halcon, um, Matrox, uh, Neurochex, uh, and, and others, as, as we are also yes, uh, fully Genicam compatible. So with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I would invite everyone to just uh, to, uh, to, to come and have a look at our Ruby camera for, for yourself or at, uh, for, uh, at our live demo. Uh, and you can find us just at the um, TKH business stand um, in Hall 10, which is not very hard to miss. So. Thank you very much for your uh, 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 thank you very much for attendance. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause to all of our speakers. Uh, if you have questions for Martin, then please go ahead. Yes, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, First one was that you talked about the color camera. Does it require uh, its own light, or is it okay work, like working with the ambient light and environment? Sorry. Ambient light, is it enough for that color camera? Yes, okay, it, it depends, it depends. Okay. <laughs> if, it's, um, if it's completely dark, um, of course, the color camera won't, won't give you color information. The depth camera will still work, because we ha it can see the laser illumination. Um, but if it's too dark, you might you might want to use some additional additional light if there. Okay. And uh, uh, how about reflective surfaces? Uh, the depth camera is uh, independent of the reflectiveness of the surface, or <laughs> yes, if reflective surfaces they are always a challenge. Um, if the if the part is not very highly reflective, uh, it can work okay. Uh, if you have a very shiny part, uh, what can happen there is that uh, you get a depth measurement of of the scene that's mirrored in the part. So suddenly you, you get a like a um, a hole uh, void area. Uh, yes, a void in that part. Um, but typically, from a analyzer's perspective, um, such errors are easily easy to detect and to filter because you just need to need to uh, threshold, for example, your your depth and and anything that's farther away than a given distance is likely a, a reflection if you if you know what what distance the parts have to the camera. Okay. 
And is random noise uh, enough as a pattern for depth measurement, or there yes, are yes, yes. Um, the thing is that the thing is that. Um, we don't, the, the camera doesn't just look at the pattern, but it also looks at the surface uh, of the parts. So um, it's more of, it's more of a, a support for the depth, depth measurement, um, the pattern projection. And um, if, we have, if we have a surface that has no visible texture at all, then um, the, the laser uh, pattern it provides anchor points for the for the measurements, and then we have a like a large interpolation between the patterns. But if you have a, like just a little bit surface texture there, then uh, we can use both information uh, for the measurements. Got it. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any more questions? If not, then I have another one. <laughs> so you mentioned low latency. Do do you have some numbers? So, sorry? You you mentioned low latency. Yes. Do you have some numbers for us? Yeah. So um, so it's, it's about the time between two frames. Um, yes. So if we run if we run the camera at at uh, 60 frames per second, then we are at 160 seconds latency. Ah. Okay. Yeah. And you uh, the the product is also FPGA based, and the we heard from the previous uh, uh, speaker that was also FPGA based, right? The C6 uh, imager. So. How are you competing, if you are competing at all? <laughs> I, think, I think we are at very different applications. So um, we have, we have uh, or, or our typical applications are, are real-time applications where we have to, um, systems that interact uh, quickly with a dynamic environment and where we need to capture a full frame, um, a, a full frame image. And, not so, not so much at the uh, production lines for us. And when you say real time, the real time requirements are coming from the customer, right? So yes. real time is something very difficult to uh, put <laughs> onto paper. <laughs> we claim real time, but what uh, real time is for each application, yes. it differs. Yes, it depends. It depends. Uh, so, but thank you very much. It was a lovely presentation from all three of you. Uh, I would invite you all to contact them if you have any more questions. They have all booths here. Uh, you could find the booth information on the slides as well. I thank you all for your attention, and I thank you all for your interesting presentations.